the 12. Good morning, San Antonio starts right now. Right now on GMSA at 8 a.m., a woman stabbed several times at a popular movie theater on the west side of town. Details from police on how it happened and the latest on that woman's condition. Plus, the 87th legislative session is over here in Texas. So how did the session go from both the Democrat and Republican perspectives? We hear from State Senators Roland Gutierrez and Donna Campbell about what happened and what comes next. And taking a live look out at the Alamo City, 72 degrees. Can't really see the sun in that shot. We're going to check in with Sarah Spivey what you can expect for the rest of your Sunday. Good morning. It is 8 o'clock this Sunday, June 6th. Thank you so much for starting your morning with us. Were you out and about after work yesterday? I was. I definitely got rained on. I didn't even have a rain jacket. I had to use a plastic bag to nice. cover my hair. It was saved. There you go. Um, <laughs> That's the important I part. Think, I don't know. Like It, it kind of got dark on us real quick, mm. Sarah. Yeah. And I know you, you said scattered showers, but... There was a storm right on the uh, Bear and Comal County line that gradually moved into Guadalupe County that produced quite a bit of rain, gusty winds, and even prompted some flash flood uh, warnings out there. Uh, but as soon as that storm was over, we were able to see the sun come out. Right now, we do have some areas of some light rain moving in from the northwest. Let's go ahead and zoom into a neighborhood view to see some areas that are being affected by some light to moderate rain, mainly the Stone Oak area right now. That's uh, 281 in Evans and just north of Reagan High School. Uh, and then further on down south along I-10, right near the medical center, which got a whole heck of a lot of rain yesterday, uh, along I-10 there and near Fredericksburg. And then finally on the south side of town, we've got some moderate rain on the southern edge of 1604 near Thelma, uh, right where 1604 and 281 meet. But these are very uh, fast moving, moving to the south and to the east and most of it is is light to moderate at times now where it is not raining, we are seeing some mist uh, outside at the airport right now. You can see uh, that uh, high humidity. It's 72 degrees with some light rain being reported at the airport right now. And visibility is down to three miles, down to two in Kerrville. Well, in today's forecast, we're going to carry a 20% chance for rain, but we will be able to see some sun and it'll be warm and humid. I'll have a look ahead coming up. Max and Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. New this morning, a wrong way driver situation ending in a terrifying crash on I-37. We now know one man is dead and a family of three in the hospital. Police say a wrong way driver traveling northbound on the southbound lanes of I-37 near the 410 interchange. Uh, this all happened around 1230 this morning. That wrong way driver hitting a vehicle head on rolling onto the wall divider. First responders and a passerby did all they could to rescue the driver, including using the jaws of life, but he died on the scene. The vehicle that was hit had a husband, wife, and their teenage son inside. All taken to Bamsey, all in serious condition. Meanwhile, a woman is in serious condition after she was attacked at the movies last night. San Antonio police say she was walking out of the Palladium Theater on I-10 West around 11 p.m. when a man walked up behind her, stabbed her multiple times, and ran off. The victim told police she did not know the suspect. The woman was taken to University Hospital, hospital to be treated. Investigators say they are looking at security video to get a better description of the suspect. This investigation continues. Now the results for city council seats here in San Antonio in District 1. Roberto Trevino not getting enough votes that he needed to get the fourth term. He is the incumbent and his competitor, Mario Bravo, came in with 54 percent. Our Tiffany Huertas was at Backyard on Broadway where Bravo celebrated with his family, friends and supporters. Working together, that's how Mario Bravo describes this race. He says he is excited about working with the community. Tackling homelessness became the spotlight issue in this race. Bravo, a project manager for the Environmental Defense Fund, says he wants to have a compassionate approach on this issue. He tells me helping people recover from the COVID-19 pandemic is at the top of his list. Roberto Trevino says he is proud of all the projects his team has accomplished, including the Homeless Resource Hub at the Del View Field Office. We're in a unique position right now because we're coming out of the pandemic. And so how can we pivot right now? You know, how can we pivot to make our city more resilient uh, from a health perspective? How can we make our economy more resilient? I, we just, we poured our heart into this. I've lived in District 1 for 23 years. Um, I've made a lot of friends. I've, I've met a lot of really good people. 
people that uh, have really, really taught me a lot. Trevino says he will continue to be involved with the community. Mario Bravo looks forward to working with everybody. For GMSA, Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. And over in District 2, a new city councilman after Jalen McKee Rodriguez defeating Jana Andrew Sullivan in the runoff. McKee Rodriguez actually had more votes in the May 1st election as well. Andrew Sullivan barely getting second place, resulting in this runoff. The win makes McKee Rodriguez the first ever openly gay man to serve on San Antonio City Council. Our crew was at his watch party last night as the final results came in. McKee Rodriguez says this win is not something he takes lightly. Every year we have so many candidates asking for votes and giving promises and the people of District 2 decided that they were going to take a chance with me when a lot of people didn't think District 2 would be ready. And when we asked Andrew Sullivan how she felt about leaving City Council after just one term, she responded simply by saying God bless District 2. And we are going to continue covering the city election results throughout this hour of GMSA. You can also read about each district at any time by visiting the Vote 2021 section on our website, ksat.com. And like City Council, we also follow the Texas legislative sessions very closely because they obviously have a huge impact on our community. What happens in the legislature, whether it's laws getting set or laws getting changed, a big effect all over Texas. And there was a lot that happened in the 87th legislative session. So joining us in today's leading essay segment is Texas State Senator Roland Gutierrez. Good morning, Senator. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Good morning to you both. Thank you for having me. All right, an eventful legislative session to say the least. So from your perspective, how did it go? And did you achieve the goals that you set out for? Well, I'll tell you, it was very challenging. It was challenging because probably the most uh, right-wing agenda we've seen in a long, long, long time. Uh, they certainly accomplished everything they set out to do. I mean, unfortunately, now we, with the heartbeat, heartbeat bill, they have, let me start off by saying that nobody is for abortion, not any Democrat or any Republican. I mean, we understand that. But now we have eliminated basically choice in Texas. Uh, due to their position on the heartbeat bill. Uh, they have the numbers and they were able to do and get away with whatever they wanted, essentially. Uh, they Now we have open carry, which is just devastating. Now everybody is gonna be able to, anybody that wants to will be able to open carry a gun uh, on their person as long as it's holstered and visible. Um, and then of course they tried to do a very, very extreme elections bill that was very detrimental to uh, to our community. Uh, from a voting rights perspective, and it's something we're going to have to be fight, fighting for, fighting against in the special session. Uh, I can tell you on the electricity side, you know, we did some good. We did, we did help uh, certainly uh, communities. We, we filed some weatherization bills that were important in those past. Um, I think that we have a lot more work to do specifically for electric consumers. Uh, I had an amendment at the very end that the Lieutenant Governor championed, which was essentially a $350 credit for every ERCOT consumer. Unfortunately, the uh, Republicans in the House didn't think it was a, as good an idea as we thought. And uh, it's important to me that next time we go back in a special session that we do something for electric consumers because we lost so much, you know, property damage, certainly over 200 lives lost. I mean, devastating results from this from this event and we need to do better for Texans and state senator you touched on this a little bit the session culminated with the Democrats walking out and preventing the passage of that voting bill can you walk us through the process that led to that walkout and are you concerned that it will be passed in the special session later this year yeah so we were I specifically we fought this bill till six in the morning. We started, they, the Lieutenant Governor started us at 10 o'clock at night. We thought we were gonna be able to filibuster the bill uh, on Sunday, but and procedurally they suspended the rules, started on Saturday. And so there was really no effective way to filibuster it by anyone. And so we in the Senate argued it till about six in the morning. Uh, at that point, it was picked up in the house and the next day and on Sunday, they were, they essentially exercised a walkout and it was about 7 p.m. at night, 8 p.m. And they were, a, by doing so, they were able to break the quorum of the house, you know, and they were able to get out and do, uh, and, and suspend everything going forward. And so now the governor has, 
there was other bills that they wanted to get done that didn't that didn't get done and so i'm sure that we're going to be facing a special session with some uh, pretty red meat issues including sb7 which was the elections bill now, from the constitutional carry law, the heartbeat bill, the voting bill, all you've mentioned, it seemed like this session was much more conservative than previous years. Now, do you think this could prompt a blue wave in Texas? You know, it's my hope that that people really begin to understand what's happening up there. And we've often said our voice is our vote, and yet it doesn't seem to be resonating with folks. And so I, I, I when I talk to people, I, I want them to know that the freedom, and I really believe this, freedom is participation in power. You have to participate because the things that are happening in Austin are, are, are hindering your freedom. They're hindering your ability to get things done, to vote the way you want. SB7 was nothing more than an attack on the measures that happened in Houston, which were essentially voter expansion. Um, what's wrong with giving more opportunities for people to vote? extra hours on Sunday. I mean, they, the typical um, souls to the polls Sunday that we have, that's very productive and, and well done on the east side of town is in, in all of our African-American communities. It was basically challenged when they said, well, we're, you're only gonna be able to do this from one to six. And so, so those are the types of election laws they were trying to pass. It wasn't anything more than eliminating our ability to get more people out. And so I hope that people are, are listening and I hope they're understanding what's happening in Austin. And it, it is devastating coming from the Republican side, for sure. Well, State Senator Roland Gutierrez, thank you so much for joining us this morning. In our next half hour, we're here from the Republican perspective from State Senator Donna Campbell. Thank you. Thank you so much. Time now, just about 812, 72 degrees out. Still ahead on GMSA, the first cruise ship since the pandemic set sail, but not everyone is happy about it. Why people in Venice were protesting the recent voyage. Plus, a Central American country looking to make Bitcoin a legal tender. Why El Salvador's president wants to take this financial route. And we're continuing our election coverage with the winner of District 3, what the candidates had to say about last night's big win. Quick live look out at the Alamo City. Some storms in and out of the area yesterday. What can we expect for the rest of the weekend and your work week? We're going to check in with Sarah Spivey in just a bit. After an election and runoff elections, Phyllis Villagran is taking her sister's place as the councilwoman for District 3. She won by 20% with the incumbent District 3 councilwoman Rebecca Villagran reaching her term limits. Phyllis beat out 11 other candidates, including Tomas Oresti, who went into a runoff just yesterday. Phyllis says she has a lot of plans she'd like to tackle day one of her new position. Infrastructure, focusing on broadband, making sure we get that to the district, make it affordable, uh, make, make sure we have digital literacy programs. The other thing is public safety, making sure we get that substation in District 3 that we need so badly, and, and then just getting the people back to work and ready to work. We also spoke with Oresti, who ran with a goal to tackle the economy, to get people back to work and children back to schools. Here's what he had to say. Not what we expected, uh, nowhere near what we expected, but uh, the citizens have, have voted. Uh, the voters have elected uh, uh, Phyllis Villagran, and uh, so we're going to stand behind the voters, and we're going to support her in, in her future decisions she's going to make. Uresti, like Villagran, thankful for a clean campaign. Villagran stressed that she plans to be very transparent with the goal of having an open-door policy with her residents. All right, busy day with the election process. Also busy day in the weather. Yesterday, we did have a storm that really hung out around uh, Bear County. Well, I disappeared there. Let me... All right, TV magic. Okay, <laughs> we did have a storm, rather, that was on uh, the uh, Bear County and Comal County line. That produced some flash flooding issues. Right now, though, this morning, the only thing we're dealing with is um, some passing rain showers. They're moving to the south and to the east. Uh, some of these rain showers are affecting uh, the northern tier of Bear County, right at 1604 in Bulverde, so just south of Johnson High School, north of Madison High School. Uh, this is going to be moving to 
to the south and to the east, likely affecting the Selma and Live Oak area. No lightning with the, these. They are just moderate light to moderate rain showers. A light to moderate rain shower falling over the AT&T Center in the Pearl right now. In fact, I bet if we were to head outside of the KSAT uh, studios, we'd see some light rain here in downtown San Antonio. And then on the south side of town, right along 37 there, uh, just at the Atascosa line and near Pleasanton, seeing some rainfall as well. But these are pushing to the east and they're going to be moving out of the area. Uh, but if you do live in Seguin, Floresville uh, and the eastern half of Bear County, east of 281, if you have early morning plans, perhaps you're going to go headed out, heading out to church this morning. Just know that you might have to use those windshield wipers once or twice. Uh, again, we do have another shower up near uh, in Comal County right now, just to the south of Spring Branch. However, where it is not raining, we are seeing some mist. This is the airport right now reporting light rain, 72 degrees at the airport and visibility is down to two miles at the airport, down to three at Bernie Stage Airfield and down to a mile and a half in Kerrville. Temperatures are, are muggy. We were looking in the uh, low to mid 70s right now, 76 in Castroville, 71 in Tarpley, 72 in New Braunfels. Uh, but this muggy weather, uh, this uh, dreary weather rather, is gonna be short lived because we'll be able to see the sunshine by about noon. And in the afternoon, we are going to have to carry a 20% chance for an isolated shower or storm. We will not have the coverage like we did yesterday where we had flash flooding issues across a good portion of Bear and Comal counties. However, if a storm develops, it could produce heavy rain at times, and we'll be watching that carefully. Other than that, it's going to be toasty 100 degrees in Del Rio out to the west, even hotter than around San Antonio, where we'll be dealing with high temperatures close to 90 degrees, 76 at 10 still pretty cloudy with a few of those spotty showers starting to clear out around noon and then in the afternoon that 20 percent chance for an isolated thunder shower southeast winds today at 10 to 15 and a high near 90. so here's a look at our weather pattern there's that big upper level low that's been bringing us this rain this weekend it is pushing off to the east in its wake we're going to see a high pressure system settle over uh, throughout the week and that's going to make it hot and and uh, we're going to see our rain chances go away. It is going to keep us humid though. Dew points are going to be in the 70s, so it's going to feel like it is in the triple digits for part of the week. We're going to be sweating. You know, that upper level low has helped us with the rain. It's kept temperatures down, but without that in place, we're going to be hot and humid, feeling a lot like summer in the week ahead. So we got the rain and now we're getting the summer months. It's feeling like it's going to be pretty hot and humid out there uh, this week. And by the way, tomorrow we do have another chance for isolated rain. In the next half hour, we'll talk about tomorrow's rain chance in San Antonio as well. Hot and humid, my absolute favorite. <laughs> it's sarcasm, right, Sarah? No. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. 821, 73 degrees though. Nigeria is banning a popular social media site for allegedly undermining the country's corporate existence. Still ahead, the threat its president made on Twitter. Plus, hundreds of people gathering to protest big boats in Venice. We explain why. The first cruise ship since the pandemic has sailed through the heart of Venice, escorted by water spouting tugboats and port workers as it traveled down the Geodeca Canal. But as the MSC Orchestra set sail, hundreds of canal side protesters and a small group of wooden boats waved no big boat signs. Yesterday, the voyage reignited an anti cruise movement that has opposed the passage of the enormous ships through the fragile lagoon due to environmental and safety concerns. All right, well, the Nigerian Ministry of Information and Culture says it has, quote, indefinitely suspended Twitter's operation in the country. It also accused Twitter of allowing its platform to be used for activities that can undermine Nigeria's, quote unquote, corporate existence. The suspension comes after the Nigerian president threatened to deal with people in the southeast for recurring attacks on public infrastructure. He tweeted that those who are misbehaving will be treated in, quote, the language they understand. El Salvador's president announced that next week he will send proposed legislation to the country's Congress that would make Bitcoin legal tender mm. in the Central American nation. He characterized it as an idea that could help El Salvador move forward. The U.S. dollar is El Salvador's official currency. The question about that is the whole point is it's decentralized. So if it made it the official tender, wouldn't that centralize it? 
I don't know. Okay. 826, 73 degrees out. Well, still ahead in our next half hour, a North Carolina student is denied his high school diploma. Why the school says wearing a Mexican flag on the stage was a problem and what comes next for the family? And we are hearing more about this year's legislative session and we're hearing about the Republican goals. State Senator Donna Campbell joining us in the second half of today's leading essay. Good morning and happy Sunday. I'm Max Massey. And I'm Sarah Costa. It is June 6th. And as we're getting more, and more into June, Sarah Spivey, things are going to start heating up a little bit. Yeah, definitely. In fact, in the week ahead, we're going to have heat index values close to 100 degrees. So be grateful for the light rain we're seeing out there right now. You know, yesterday across uh, parts of uh, northeastern Bear and into Comal and Guadalupe County. We did have some flooding issues from a storm, but right now really only dealing with some light rain that's moving through that area uh, just to the south of Canyon Lake. So near Smithson Valley, uh, right at that Bear County and Comal County line, just to the northwest of Garden Ridge. Selma, Live Oak, if you're joining us early this morning, you're seeing some moderate rain. These are pushing to the south and to the east, so they'll be affecting shirts in JBSA Randolph here shortly. And then near China Grove, uh, just outside of Loop 410 near Martinez and China Grove, seeing this light rain shower that's going to be pushing out toward Lone Oak, Adkins, and perhaps even Calaveras Lake. And then finally, in Wilson and in Atascosa counties, we've got some uh, light to moderate rain near Pleasanton and Jordan, uh, Jordanton. Rather. These are uh, pushing to the east, and so they'll affect uh, areas in Guadalupe and Wilson counties here shortly. Where it is not raining, uh, we are seeing some mist. Whoops, everything's all right. I just dropped my clicker. This is live TV. All righty, we are seeing some mist. This is a look at the airport. You can see the low clouds there. 72 degrees at the airport. Southeast winds at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Visibility is down to 2 miles at the airport, down to a mile and a half in Kerrville. Looking ahead for the rest of the day, we're going to see skies gradually clear. I did have to put a 20% chance for an isolated shower or storm in the forecast through the afternoon, uh, but rain should not be as widespread as it was yesterday. I'll detail this forecast coming up for you in just a bit. And of course, the toasty temperatures in the week ahead. I'll also hold on to my clicker a little bit better. <laughs> Sarah, Mac. Thank you, Sarah. Well, back to the results for the city council runoff elections. Terry Castillo's camp very enthusiastic and excited for her to be the winner for District 5. That's right. Jonathan Coto has reactions from both candidates. Terry Castillo's camp is very enthusiastic with the results and excited to be the projected winner for District 5. Castillo says she's ready to put the work in in District 5. From an increase in the poverty rate to the housing crisis, Castillo says she plans to hit the ground running. Right now, her top priorities are supporting the community and creating bold changes. Steering District 5 in a direction that works for us is possible, and it's going to take communities coming together in collaboration to get there, and I look forward to working with everybody all throughout the district. We spoke with the competitor Rudy Lopez tonight, who says he's confident Castillo will do what's needed for District 5. In conversation with guests in attendance, they describe Castillo as an unapologetic Latina, and she's ready to be the voice for her community. Reporting from the 1906 Art Complex in District 5, Jonathan Cotto, KSAT 12 News. Well, meanwhile, District 9 Councilman John Courage wins a third term in office. He holds off challenger Patrick Von Dolan by capturing nearly 54% of the vote. Courage did extremely well in the early vote and among absentee ballots, allowing him to hold off a late charge from Von Dolan. I've never come on council with my own agenda. My agenda is the agenda for the people in our district. And I've listened to them. I've assembled a staff that is really dedicated and committed to meeting their needs and their objectives. District 9 had by far the best voter turnout of any of the five runoff elections. Well, Texas's 87th legislative session is over and it was eventful to say the least. Multiple bills put up to a vote by our state representatives and the session even included a walkout to prevent a bill from getting voted into law. Uh, in the last half hour, we spoke with Democratic State Senator Roland Gutierrez, and now we're hearing from the Republican perspective with Donna Campbell. She was unable to join us live this morning, so we pre-recorded our interview, or interview with her yesterday. So just take a listen to our conversation. Good morning, State Senator Donna Campbell. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Glad to join you. 
All right, so it has been an eventful time at the Capitol. How do you think the legislative session went and were all of your goals accomplished? Well, we most certainly started with a different session, more DPS, masks, testing, social distancing, plexiglass everywhere, hit by the winter storm, Uri. But, you know, the Senate rose to the occasion and we had a good session. We did pass bills that will help winterize generation generators. So should this happen again, we've got that covered. We changed the makeup of the PUC and the ERCOT board. We securitized the electric market and stabilized both the grid and the market, making access for the electric providers to cheaper loans, and that helps all of us. We expanded broadband access, protected the elderly so that should another state of emergency occur, families can still see their loved ones. We passed a conservative balanced budget, still maintained funding for schools, and even expanded Medicaid for postpartum women. Now, it was two months, now up to six. Was disappointed that we did have some bills pass the Senate, but not the House, and that was election integrity, bail bond reform, and then Small Business Protection Act, which is so important to keep local governments from egregiously entering, you know, affecting the private business, so. Senator Campbell, it was a very busy uh, session and this cycle with the constitutional carry law, the heartbeat bill and the voting bill seemed to lean very conservative. So what prompted all of these bills? Well, conservative issues have never changed. We passed legislation that support our police, expanded your ability to defend yourself, protect religious liberty, protects the sanctity of life. And that's always been our values. This session, we honored those rights, the right of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So nothing's changed, just a different way to approach it. And so, you know, you mentioned the voter integrity bill, um, the voting bill. Now, the one of the last nights of the legislative cycle, we saw the Democrats walk out. Oh. Yes. What was your reaction to that? And, you know, Governor Abbott mentioned a special session. You know, when do you think that'll be and what can we expect from it? Well, SB7 is the election bill, and this is a bill that promotes integrity for elections. Personally, I don't know why anyone would not want secure elections. And I would say, in my opinion, running away from duty is poor strategy. All right, one more thing before you go. You sponsored HB9, the bill that raises criminal offense for protesters blocking roadways and preventing emergency vehicle access. Now, it was passed, and Governor Abbott thanked you. So what prompted this bill, and what do you hope it does? Well, you know, last year, we're all aware of the civil unrest that was across the nation. In California, protests erupted around a hospital where police had been taken. We also saw protests on our Capitol, at our Capitol, and one period of time, they blocked I-35. So this is a preemption bill that, that states blocking of emergency vehicles on roadways trying to get to the ER, there will be a state jail penalty. You know, we can't take the chance of our critical roads going to a hospital, a medical facility being blocked. So that's why that's very important. And then on another note, while I didn't sponsor the bill, I co-authored a bill that prevents defunding of our police. And I think all this works together because I back the blue and we need to defend our police. All right, State Senator Donna Campbell, thank you so much for your time this morning. Thank you. If you watch that full interview right now, just head to the leading essay section of KSAT.com. New this morning, police say a fight on West Salinas escalated to gunshots. A woman may have been hit in the head with a baseball bat. This was the scene. Police there still working to figure out what exactly happened. Now, this was around 1015 last night. This is the 2100 block of West Salinas. Uh, officers said that it was a rolling disturbance. They tell us about four to five gunshots were fired at a vehicle. No one was shot, but one woman was transported to the hospital after police say she may have been hit in the head with that bat. Investigators still working to figure out who is responsible. One man in the hospital being treated for smoke inhalation after flames filled his home on Palfrey Street last night. Firefighters on scene tell us it appeared the fire started near the roof and and spread arson investigators are on the scene working to figure out how it sparked. We know a man who appeared to be in his 60s was at home at the time and was taken to the VA hospital for that smoke inhalation treatment. 
In your morning headlines today is the 77th anniversary of D-Day. Allied troops turned the tide of the war in Europe in a historic surprise attack. Now, this all happened during World War II. The Battle of Normandy, which lasted from June 1944 to August, now, resulted in the Allied liberation of Western Europe from Nazi control. The battle on June 6, 1944, now known as D-Day, that is when some 156,000 American, British, and Canadian forces landed on five beaches along a 50-mile stretch of the heavily fortified coast of France's Normandy region. An estimated 2,500 Americans died on D-Day. In 2021, this will be the second year in a row that the pandemic will restrict veterans and families of fallen soldiers from visiting the beaches of Normandy and France. Despite this pandemic, though, a lot of people visited France. They visited the local monuments and they paid their respects. A North Carolina teen was denied his diploma after walking across a graduation stage wrapped in a Mexican flag. From the student's perspective, he claims he was just celebrating his cultural heritage, but the school claims it is not against freedom of expression, but noted the dress code allowed decoration only on the graduation cap. However, with growing national attention, the school says it is working with the student's family and he will receive his diploma. Time now is 841, 73 degrees out. A UT Health graduate says she knew exactly what she wanted to do for the rest of her life since she was a teenager. After the break, we introduce you to our final great graduate next. Taking a live look out at the Alamo City, 73 degrees to start your Sunday morning. What is the rest of the day? What does a week look like? We're going to check in with Sarah Spivey in just a moment. Welcome back. A dentistry student at UT Health is the focus of today's college great graduates. Anna Katharina Tosti not only has a passion for medicine, but loves to work with people in other ways. That's right. Meyer Arthur has her story. Most high school students aren't exactly sure what they want to do for the rest of their lives, but that was not the case for Anna Katarina Tosti. The University of Texas Health San Antonio graduate says she remembers the moment she first decided her career path. I was actually very strategic about it. When I was in 11th grade, I kind of just sat down and I was like, okay, what job do I want to do? Katarina decided to study dentistry with a specialization in periodontics. So periodontics is a dental specialty in which you focus heavily on um, the bone surrounding the teeth. Um, so that can involve things like sinus lifts, uh, bone surgeries, gum surgeries, placing implants. It's more of a surgical field. But Katarina has done more than just work on teeth while at UT Health. She's also served as her class president and worked as a French interpreter for the San Antonio Refugee Health Clinic. There's a dental medical clinic uh, where we treat refugees uh, for lower costs. Um, and a lot of the patients there don't speak English, so a lot of them are Arabic or uh, from Asia. Um, and we have a couple of patients from Africa who uh, spoke only French. Katarina says studying medicine has not been easy, but she was able to make it through with the love and support of her family. Ten years ago, if you told me I was going to be a doctor, I probably wouldn't have believed it. Um, but I'm very happy to be where I am, and it's been it's been a long journey. It hasn't always been easy, um, but overall it's been great. If everything goes as planned, Katarina will receive her degree in dentistry this summer and then enroll in the school's residency program. Myra Arthur, KSAT 12 News. That's amazing. Really awesome. Yeah, congratulations to her. Now we have seen a little bit of light rain around there today and we are looking at uh, the chance for about a 20% chance for some isolated showers and potentially some storms in the afternoon, but it should not be as widespread as as it was yesterday. I'm going to go ahead and pause this real quick and actually show you the 24 hour rainfall total so you can see the areas that it really rained pretty hard and that was mainly right along that Bear Comal County line and those spots like Bilverde Timberwood Park and west of New Braunfels those areas saw a radar indicated up to four inches of rainfall. What we've got going on right now though are just some light rain showers that are generally moving to the south and to the east zooming into Bear County here and the Guadalupe County line. Uh, the Shirts and Selma area just got this moderate rain shower that's pushing near Cibolo as well. So Cibolo, you look outside, there are
are some areas of light to moderate rain between Atkins and Lone Oak there right along 87 and 1604 and then just to the east of Calaveras Lake into uh, Wilson County along 181. So Floresville, Sutherland Springs, you'll probably get some light to moderate rain as well. And then we've had some light rain moving through Atascosa County near Jordanton and Pleasanton. Where it is not raining, however, we are seeing some areas of mist and patchy fog. You can see a look outside right now at the airport and the visibility has been improving, but we've still got low clouds there, 72 degrees. There was some light rain reported at the airport about 30, 40 minutes ago, and visibility is down to two miles at Bernie Stage Airfield and down to three at San Antonio International Airport. Now we are going to see skies clear today. Around noon, we'll be looking at skies clearing and we'll actually see plenty of sunshine in the afternoon. It's in the afternoon hours that we're going to have to watch for a pop up th shower or thunderstorm. And although we won't see coverage like we did yesterday, wherever the rain does set up, it could be heavy at times and we'll monitor those carefully. Other than that, it's going to be hot out to the west, 100 degrees in Del Rio, 98 for the high in Eagle Pass. And around San Antonio, we'll be looking at high temperatures near 90 degrees, but the humidity, you're going to feel it. It'll probably feel closer to 95 degrees this afternoon because of the high humidity. And again, look at that 20% chance for an isolated shower or storm throughout the day. Sun will set after 830. Southeast winds a little breezy at times, 10 to 15 miles per hour. So a wide view of uh, tomorrow's future cast, and there is going to be a complex of storms that sets up early tomorrow morning across North Texas. We'll be watching this carefully as it'll send some outflows, uh, outflow boundaries south uh, near the Austin area and potentially here in San Antonio as well. So about a 20 to 30 percent chance for isolated showers or storms in the afternoon. But most of us again just going to be experiencing a warm and muggy Monday with a high temperature near 90 degrees. Our upper level weather pattern shows the pesky low that's been around for a while moving off to the east finally and behind that rain chance tomorrow an upper level high pressure system is going to move in place and that's what's going to take out our rain chances for most of this upcoming week. But with the rain going, the heat cranks up. Temperatures are going to be close to 90 degrees every day, but with high humidity, it should feel closer to 100. So yeah, give or take, you, you either get the rain or you get the heat. That's why and I like the rain. Mm. All right, I'm, I'm a fan. I'm not. I know. <laughs> Just about 851, 73 degrees out. Well, summertime means big discounts on several popular items and tools, tech and clothing. Tomorrow on GMSA, we'll tell you when and where you can expect deals to pop up in your favorite store. And the news you need to know before you go, San Antonio police searching for the man that responsible for stabbing a woman at the Palladium last night. Officers tell us the woman was walking out of the movies when the suspect came behind her, stabbed her multiple times, and then ran off. He was taken to university. She was taken to university hospital in serious condition. Investigators say they are still combing through the area, searching and looking at security video to get a better description of the suspect. We just got the pollen count in and molds are even higher than they were yesterday, past 17,000. We do have some showers moving out of the county into Wilson and Guadalupe County, light rain showers. Today, a 20% chance for an isolated storm in the afternoon, 90 degrees for the high, 20% chance for rain tomorrow as well. And then we'll be warming on up. Temperatures will be in the 90s with heat index values closer to 100. 100 degrees. So we're saying goodbye to the rain, but we're saying hello to the heat. Thank you, Sarah. And before we go, I just want to give a quick shout out to my Aww. parents. Happy anniversary, mom and dad. That is Danny and Patty Acosta. They've been Aww. married for 40 years today, but they actually met in 1969. So they've known each other for what is that over 50 years now? Um, wow. They've been their high school sweethearts at Eagle Pass High School, which Aww. is in our viewing area. Mm -hmm. And um, they met, I think, in eighth grade. But happy anniversary. That's Love you amazing. guys. <laughs> Have a great rest of your day. Have a good Sunday.